All right, so we are recording. So this is Taboo Talk, uh, the safe space for exploring the edge of the status quo. I'm Sunny, the host. I do this show every week live on Thursdays. You can watch the replays if you go to tabutalk.us of all the past subjects we've done. We've done sex and religion and marriage and all sorts of fun stuff. So you can go watch those. But today we are talking about race and racism. And I have lovely guests with me here today. I'm going to let you guys introduce yourself and then I'll loop back around to me and give you kind of why I'm excited to talk about the subject. Who would like to go first? Ladies first, please. <laughs> General. Okay, 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 okay. Right. Um, so hi, everyone. Um, my Twitter name is that damn Natasha, but I go by Natasha in real life. I am a singer, producer, um, just all around great person. I'm a first generation American. So being a part of this conversation about race is really, I'm like super excited because I know I have a different perspective um, beyond just what you what you hear about and, you know, in the media from the American perspective, because my family comes from the West Indies. I also have that background. So, you know, I'm just looking forward to the conversation today because Sunny's my girl, and I'm meeting Mr. Cadigan. Yes. Is that correct? Yes, yes. All yes. right. Yes. So meeting Mr. Cadigan today for the first time. So I think this is going to be a really interesting conversation. We're going to just have a really good time talking about it. Awesome. Yes. Awesome. Is, and then just to give us a little bit more context about who you are, Natasha, can you just kind of tell us like where you live and just some of like your demographic information, just so we all have a point of reference? <laughs> Sure. So demographically, I live in the Northeast Coast, specifically New York and more specifically Harlem. Mm. So, yes. yeah, that should give you a little something. <laughs> and what do you invest your most of your time in? Oh, like what do you do? What do you want to say about what you do? So what I do is mm, I basically create great content. So for a television, for um, the stage, for people that have like exciting lives around entertainment. And that's where I'm spending most of my time. And um, the other part of like where I am geographically, because I just came back is Trinidad and Tobago. So um, I'm actually between both and I'm enjoying being between both and seeing like what content I create around, not just race, but a lot of other topics. Um, coming from both of those perspectives, you know, that's what I'm really looking forward to about this conversation tonight. Awesome. 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 I'm so glad you're here. Mr. Kevin. You want to give us, do you want to explain when you intro yourself, can you explain like why we call you Kevin? That would be helpful too. Sure, sure. So my, my government name is Kevin. Uh, and I've, hey, I've learned hey. to, hold on, sorry. My little ones are. On the no worries. Kevin's a dad in case we, yeah, that's, that's awesome. Yeah. Sorry about that. <laughs> um, Kevin, uh, I've learned to put the Aquans in the middle because that is my author, writer, writer name that I have published two books under. Uh, I'm also a mentor and a public speaker. Uh, those are two new worlds that I've kind of ventured in towards trying to just expand uh, my to-do list that I, I like to be successful in. Uh, it's really interesting that Natasha said she's from the Caribbean. My folks are Guyanese, uh, so I too am a uh, first generation Caribbean American. Born in Brooklyn, so shout outs to Harlem. That's nice. That's awesome. Uh, but I'm currently uh, in Orlando, Florida, so that is my home. And this is the second taboo talk that Sunny's invited me to, so I'm super honored. Uh, the reason why I'm so passionate about this topic is I was fortunate to graduate from the University of Florida in 2004. And in 2004, we didn't have a program for minority studies. So in my last year at the University of Florida, we created a African-American studies program, which I received my minor in. So for me, this is a topic that I'm super duper passionate. I spent an entire semester studying. I even have my textbook in front of me just in case it gets heavy. <laughs> but um. Super excited to be here and thank you so much for inviting me looking forward to the conversation. That's so awesome. I didn't even know all of that about you. Yeah. yeah. Nice. Um, okay, so I'm Sunny. Um, I'm white. 
Let's get that out of the way. <laughs> um, if it, so, I, I I spend a lot of time in the LGBTQ world, like the the gay and lesbian, alliance, and I, I I am on that. I'm in that world, and I also consider myself an ally of that world. And the reason I'm passionate about this subject is I consider myself an ally of people who are dealing with discrimination and minority. Like I. I work really hard not to deal in those those terms of like color and ethnicity. Like I, I enjoy celebrating our diversity and I stand in our sameness. And I have been really frustrated lately because I feel like there's nothing I can say or do that's right. No matter what I say or do as a white woman, I'm in trouble. If I try to help, I'm in trouble because I'm acknowledging that there's a difference between this. If I don't acknowledge it, like, so I was really excited to be able to get in like a public platform in a safe environment and get some context from folks on how, how can I navigate the world of race and racism being in the majority in a way that's supportive and safe and helpful and doesn't rile up people when that's not my intent at all. Um, so I'm excited to, to kind of dive into that side of things a little bit with you guys, especially because I know that you guys can go there with me and keep it safe and awesome. So um, yeah, Sweet. let's start with something that's maybe a little less personal though, a little easier. Um, have you either of you been following the whole conversation with the Oscars? I think the whole world <laughs> was honestly, our world. I've talked to a few people about it in the past couple of days because they were asking me about this episode and like what we were going to cover. And I said, we're going to talk about the Oscars. They're like, why are you talking about the Oscars? It's about race. I'm like, oh, you don't watch the news. I don't watch the news either. I have friends who inform me. So yeah. So, okay. So the way I understand it, there's a whole school of thought that would basically, for all intents and purposes, like to see affirmative action show up in the Academy Awards and in, the, in Hollywood. Am I correct in my understanding? Is that what you guys are getting as well? Like, what do you guys think of what's happening? I think than the affirmative mm -hmm. action, I think it really goes down to the roles that they're receiving, the roles that are available to play. I mean, if you look at the statistics, the Oscars are 87 years old, um, and there's only been 32 African-American winners in the history of, of the, the Academy doing the awards. So. And it's not that they're not making great movies or they're not great actors or actresses. It's just something's happening in Hollywood and it's been happening for years that's stopping, I don't even want to call it affirmative action. Just We're just not given the same opportunity for lack of better words. Okay, so do you think that boycotting the Oscars was a successful way of supporting that conversation? I didn't watch it. I'm sorry. I think. Sorry, got it. Well, I did. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think that is like, it's twofold, right? When you have really successful people in Hollywood, according to um, media standards, like a Jada Pinkett Smith, a Will Smith, you know, when you have them coming out and voicing their opinions about it. And then you have Chris Rock who's hosting, talking about that. What it actually does is bring attention to the conversation and it raises awareness so that now people can start to look at it from how do I participate and how don't I participate? You know, Chris Rock said something that was really, I thought really smart and brilliant on his part when he said, when he talked about racism from the point of it's not, you know, burning cross racism in Hollywood. It's more like sorority break, sorority based, you know, um, you're not really a part of this club. We like you, but you're not a part of this club. And I think that's where racism in this, in this century has gone. It's more a are you a part of my clique? It's not that I don't like you, but I'm not really familiar with how to deal with you. So I'm just gonna stay over here and you stay over there and everything should work out just fine. Not really getting that that too is a form of racism. You know, it's like alienation. You're alienating people and not really seeing the dynamics of what people can bring to the table. Okay, so, all right. So I'm gonna say straight away, 
like you, people in the, so first of all, guys in the chat, if you have a specific question that you want us to address, put a slash Q in front of it and that'll show up for us so we can keep up because sometimes it's easy to lose track. Um, but the, the, I'm not super well informed on the Oscars. Like I only know a little bit, right? I didn't go do this like super deep investigation. Um, but from what I understand, there, the, a lot of the conversation came from the fact that this year specifically, there was no African-American or black person in general nominated. Um, and that there was no movies yep. that really starred any people of minority races to be nominated. Now, I have a few things about that. Yep. The first thing I'll say is that I think the same conversation could be applied to any minority. I don't think it's really just a, a black thing, which is why I appreciate that the hashtag that came out was Oscar so white versus like Oscar's not black or whatever. <laughs> um, but then mm -hmm. also like, the way I understand it from the people I know in the movie industry, which I do know a few people, um, movies are made with the intention of being on Oscar nom. And people who are making movies about, people who are making movies that are going to have a plethora of roles for minorities are not making movies with the Oscar nomination in mind. So like, are, I'm curious, like, I guess I haven't, I haven't seen any complaints from the people in the movies themselves. And maybe it's just I haven't seen them. But I haven't seen any complaints from the people in the movies themselves that they weren't nominated. I'm seeing complaints from the people who were nominated that others weren't, or that, you know, like Jada Pinkett Smith is a big star and she's complaining and she actually has like a legitimate path to an Oscar. But I haven't seen people from like straight out of Compton complaining that they weren't nominated. Am I just missing that? Honestly, I think they're I think they're used to it. I think they've been so overlooked for so many years that Mm. Kind of are making these movies with the expectation of listen, we're doing this for the entertainment purpose of of society, and and we know that we'll make a legacy. For me, I think back to movies that I grew up on, so Belly, uh, Paid in Full, uh, just different urban movies that I can remember in my genre. If you ask any young person, they'll say that was the greatest movies of, of all time, but it never became Oscar nominated. But in our in our circle those movies are legendary and i think that's where we are now it's like we're going to make movies that are legendary for us and whatever the world thinks about it so be it gotcha yeah it you know and just to piggyback on what you're saying it's gotten to the point where if you're every director every actor is looking for the oscar you know, you're not re you're not just making it to say I'm going to make it. You are looking and hoping that you do get the acknowledgement of just being nominated or being mentioned that you could be nominated. Like I'll take Concussion for example. When that movie came out, I know Will Smith was looking for the nomination because there was talk about it. They talked about how well he played the role, how it was going to offend you know, the um, the higher ups in the NFL. It was a big movie that got no recognition for what it was actually, it was su something that was substantive. It was a really current conversation that people are talking about, you know, the dangers of um, the NFL, the dangers of play right now, how many um, NFL players are not being treated, you know, in a way that looks at, how they're going to retire from the game. So it, it was very much a current movie, something that anyone could participate in. And I know that what, I don't know for a fact, but this is what I know to be true. I'm stealing from Bill Maher. That not even getting a little bit of a nod for looking at what the movie brought to the table. Not, if, I mean, it didn't get even like an honorable mention, like nothing. It says something about who's in position to vote because really that's where it comes from. Who's the voting, who's the nominating body? You know, are there, is someone um, posted in the live chat stats that, you know, African-Americans make up 14% of the population. Okay, that's fair. Um, do African Americans make up 14% of the voting body for the Oscars? You know, do they make up 14% of voting bodies for you know not just the Oscars but for other things? You know, within our society. So if we're gonna like start well, so, putting okay. um, 
stats well, and numbers. But how do you know, we, it has to, are we how, how do we do fix that? that other than saying you how do we have other than saying black people black. in the in the academy and having like basically affirmative action? Like how did they that's that's where I'm like, I don't have a good solution, but I don't know that having the conversation saying you now need to intentionally add people of color to balance things out. I mean, because I, I, I'm looking at it from the conversation about women. Like I would not want to be hired because mm -hmm. I'm a woman to solve a stat for affirmative action to make sure women are in the workplace. I want to be hired because I deserve it. And that goes back to making sure I get the education. Right. And like, I mean, that's, it's, it ends up being part of a much bigger conversation, right? So from a Hollywood right. perspective is kind of forcing the hand, so to speak, of the academy to mm -hmm. include people of color. Is that really a solution or is it a bigger conversation that we as a society need to be demanding roles for not just people of color, but people of minorities, people with disabilities? Like, do we want to, do we need to demand a more diverse um, showing when we go for, to be entertained? Oh, How definitely. Do do You're, I think what we miss is that our dollars speak more than our dollars actually speak what we want. You know, if you go to a particular movie um, I'm just Tyler Perry. I'm not a big fan of Tyler Perry, but I love where he's come from and what he's created, right? He's really created that outside of the Hollywood realm. And what people cannot deny is that his fan base will follow him. He gets the kind of attention that he gets because the money follows him. People vote with their dollar. He puts out a Medea movie, people go see it. He puts out something else, people go see it. So they follow him with their dollar. And if we started following more things with our dollar, it it may not change like 100% right now, but it does make a difference in what people look it's at. It's interesting because I, I choose, like from a movie perspective, I choose what I put my money into based on the graphics. Mm -hmm. So I only pay to see a movie in theaters if it's going to be really enhanced by seeing it in a theater. So like a Tyler Perry movie, I would love to see, but I'd be like, oh, I'll Netflix that one, right? Or I'll, I'll get it from a red box <laughs> because it's not worth the, I mean, movies have gotten so expensive. It's like, I really curate what I see based on the experience I'm going to have. Um, so it's an interesting perspective of like intentionally going out and investing that money in movies to promote what the movie is about or who's been cast in and whatnot. But well, to your point, Sunny, the, films that are labeled African-American in genre don't receive the same budgets as these big screen uh, blockbuster movies that are coming out that are luring people in. So if you if you think about, I think for me, one of my biggest movies that I loved recently was Creed. And I, I went to see it strictly because it had Michael B. Jordan in it. He's a young, you know, we kind of have the same similar thing going here. So I went out to support the movie and I knew it had uh, Sylvester Stallone in it. And then when I saw when the Oscars came on that Sylvester Stallone was nominated for that supporting actor, but Michael B. Jordan, who was the lead role in that movie, didn't receive anything. It kind of just made me scratch my head and say, something's not right here. Like, I think he deserved an opportunity just like Sylvester Stallone did to get a well, I want to circle back to that. Um, you know, you mentioned that it, the movies that are labeled like the African American genre aren't given those budgets. I, from my perspective, I don't know that it's even. I don't know that even if the movie that was labeled an African American genre was given a bigger budget, I don't know that with me that I would necessarily go see that, regardless, because I don't necessarily have an interest in the African American culture. I mean, I personally do, but you know, like as a, as the mass majority, I would think that it's more about making sure that movies that do have the budget and do have the graphics and are going to attract a big audience in the theater, cast people of a diverse nature, regardless of, like in your mind, from where you're coming from, is it really important that movies that are specifically focused on an African-American culture be raised up in the Academy and get Oscar nomination, get recognized? Or is it more about getting people of color more opportunities in general? Why couldn't we have both? No, I think it's about Oh, sorry. Yeah. Yeah. Why can't we have both? Like one movie that just popped into mind, Transformers. Transformers was originally based in Chicago. Right now, if it's based in Chicago, there is a there's a black population in Chicago. Yet of the cast members, there were no black people 
like visibly, there may have been some in the background, but in terms of speaking roles, you just didn't have that. And when you did have someone that sounded like they could be African-American, they were an alien and they were a vehicle and they spoke like to some weird version of slang that I could barely understand. You know, so it's like, where do you get when do you start to add diversity to have the the landscape actually look like the people who live in the country or in the area that you're portraying? It's like making a movie in New York and never talking about, you know, the, you only speak about the 2 million people that live here and not talking about the other 6 million people that make up the rest of the New York culture. It, it just, it, there has to be a balance. And I think that's like a big missing, just finding that right balance. Yeah. What you got, Kevin? <laughs> we just need, a, it's been, it, it's it's like jobs, it's like anything. It's just, we just need a level playing field. That's, that's all we ever ask for. That's all we ever need. We don't want a leg up. We don't want more than anybody else, just a fair chance and I think when it comes to acting, I mean, it's similar to sports. We're, we're, I feel like we always give it 110%, not saying any other races don't, but I know because we have that chip on our shoulder uh, when it comes to other things besides Hollywood, that we give it that extra mile. And again, we're not being rewarded for going that extra mile when we do those things. So that's all we, that's, I mean, at the end of the day, it's all just about a level playing field. Okay, so let's talk about this idea of a level playing field. How, it's so interesting because I've traveled a lot and race is such a much, it's a much more dominant conversation in the U.S. than anywhere else I've been. Um, and we, you know, we know the history of, of why that might be. Um, but how, how do we accomplish that level playing field? Like, like just in like basic everyday stuff. Heavy questions. Uh -huh. <laughs> well, give an example of what you mean by basic everyday stuff. Well, so there's a video that was going around. I, I think I posted as part of promos for this on Facebook. Of um, it was a video of a, of a like a little mini documentary of a woman who was in line and trying to cash a check, and her sister-in-law, who was white, had gone before her, had no problems, and then she went as a black woman, and they asked for her ID, they asked for this, they asked for that. It took her like ten minutes to get this cash, this check accepted. And the conversation mm -hmm. was, what should or could anyone have done about that to acknowledge that she was being discriminated against and it wasn't a level playing field? Mm -hmm. So like, that's just one like, basic everyday that... example. My light's like tripping out over here. Like I'm, gonna <laughs> I'm glad you mentioned that video because yeah, I, I saw that um, back in November. And I think the perfect example of that was her, I think it was her sister-in-law who actually turned around and acknowledged the, made a reference to the cashier that that's not what you asked for from me. You know, like she was in a position to actually say something in the moment. And I think what happens is, um, it's kind of like something you mentioned earlier. People may feel like if I say something, uh, it's not my place to say, or I don't really know the full situation, so why should I say something? You know, we have a lot of considerations about whether or not we should step in. And we're making up consequences for stepping in versus just stepping in and then dealing with what comes after that. You know, because her sister-in-law really didn't have to say anything, and she did. And then what happened was, you know, this, there was this nice viral spread of um, this incident that allowed people to say, hmm, well, would I do that? You know, it put the conversation out there for not just that cashier, but everyone else who was on the adjacent lines and around, you know, seeing what was happening, asking that question for themselves, is that something I would do? Have I seen that happen before? Do I want this to happen in my community? Because that's really what's gonna actually move this to the level, level playing field. It's people on the field actually doing something and not sitting up in the stands about it. So it's, 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 it's 2016. I think what I'm used to hearing a lot is there's a black president, the, the 
playing field has never been more level than it is today. And, and it's actually, if you take a step back and take a look at things, it's actually a little worse. Um, I mean, I hate to get into politics too much, but if you take a look at what's going on right now with Donald Trump and his movement, um, you're seeing a slight uptick in in the KKK. And I mean, there hasn't, there's never been a time I think, or that I can remember when going back in a lot of my history books where race and not so hatred, but divide has been in, in our society, like going back to days of, oh God, I don't know. That just, it's, it's so funny now because what's happening is people are not afraid to speak their mind and we have the platform to do that with social media. And so when it comes to level playing field, it's, it's, really, it's gonna be really difficult to get because there's these pockets in America where people are still being discriminated on and it's not being televised. People are getting killed and it's not being televised. Uh, it's a hard question you're asking, Sonny. I don't know, I really don't know the answer how to level the playing field, but we're not getting closer to doing it today than we were back in the 60s and 70s. That's you don't think opinion. we're getting closer at all? And here's, here's where I'm asking that from, Kevin. I'm thinking of all of the, the people who fought in the 60s and 70s for what we have now. And I'm wondering if those people that were there for the civil rights rallies would agree with you. Like, I'm, I'm looking at it from a big picture perspective. Like, have we really not come? I mean, I, I have a black boyfriend. We walk down the street. We don't get rocks thrown at us. I would say that's a pretty big leap from the 50s. I mean, I, that, that could just be my white privilege. I don't know. Like, do, I mean, like seriously, like I'm giving you a chance to to think about it and like, you know, let's talk about it. Like, have we really not come far? Have we really not improved? We we have. Okay, we have. Um, if you if we're talking more black figures in the forefront being visible uh, and having a certain level of celebrity and power, yes, we, we have that more now so than ever. But when it comes to civil liberties and basic rights uh, that every person should have, whether race uh, or sexuality, I think that's where we see the, the big difference uh, with race, honestly. Um, and so, it, again, you're right, there, there's been advancements with people in power and people in front of the camera. But I think in in the in the inner cities of Chicago and you know the the slums of different suburbs, it's still it's still the same. Uh, what's the word I'm looking for? It's just the same being held down like, that we've seen in the '60s. Yeah, it's more like not how far we've come, but how many lateral moves we've more made. You know, it's um, if you look at it kind of like um, being in corporate America, you can either go up the ladder or make a, a lateral move. And I think in, in terms of race, we've made a lot of lateral moves, but we haven't bridged the gap in terms of what it looks like to be equal. We're still measuring, we're still using like a 1940s yardstick to measure what equality looks like in 2016. You know, having, you, you make comments in the media like from Anthony Scalia about, you know, blacks being able to go to, they should go to a secondary, you know, kind of college that had that secondary kind of education because you know they're not gonna um, they're not gonna succeed in a in a more prestigious school anyway. That is something I would expect to hear in the 20s and 30s, not in 2016 when everyone basically has a smartphone and can get it for a penny. You know um, when information is so rampant that any you can go to any child on the street and say, "Hey, I don't know how to do this on my phone," and Black, white, Asian, doesn't matter. They can show you in a matter of seconds and be annoyed that you don't catch on, right? So I think in terms of advancement, we have a lot of old mindset 
in powerful places that's using an old measuring stick based on something that they believe is what's best. And we don't have enough, you know, young modern thinkers. And I don't mean young in terms of age. I just mean young in terms of where we are in 2016. Yeah, I feel like, I mean, so my mom and I got really into researching the civil rights movement together a few years ago. We went on a road trip and watched a bunch of documentaries, drove my dad really crazy. Um, and looking at how things were in the 60s with Martin Luther King at their forefront and where we are today, from where I'm sitting, it seems like we did, like we've kind of done this and it's been like this really slow, like up and over, up and over, and then sometimes we go backwards and then we go and then in and I think what a lot of us would like to see is a straight increase. Um, and I, I kind of equate it a little bit to the LGBT movement in that sometimes we gotta go through it to raise awareness to get to the other side where we can make a leap forward. Um, so what what do you guys see happening in society? today, I see your question, Sarah. Um, what, what do you guys see happening in society today that you like, that you think is actually starting to move us towards kind of an equal playing field? Is there anything? <laughs> there is, I'm not gonna say there isn't, there is. Um, I think one of the things that I Love is use of social media and that young young people have an outlet to really share what's happening in their world right now. It's something that um, it, it actually gets you connected a lot quicker than waiting for, you know, a larger media outlet to come out and talk about it, um, you know, any kid, any person, and it doesn't matter where they are, can pick up their phone and you know post a video to Facebook. Do you see YouTube, people using Google social Plus, media like, in a way that's forwarding equality though? Like are you seeing specific actions and things happening where you're like, oh, that's good. That, that's actually gonna get us some movement. Or are you just excited about the fact that it's accessible? Like are you seeing anybody use it in a way that's actually forwarding things? No, I'm more excited about the fact that it's accessible now what what needs to happen is how do you take that and use it to move something forward um i don't mean to jump because we know how to go ahead sorry go ahead. no i was going to say i knew yeah. we were going to talk about um, it next was the the black lives matters movement which i was going to just say to me has been super exciting to see that whole movement i think if, if we're looking for examples that would be a prime one because what you're seeing is to your point, Natasha, a ton of young people using social media the way it should be used to, to highlight injustice, uh, document it, and mm -hmm. then like gather a bunch of people around one cause and look to change it. We've seen that again with the, with the Black Lives Matters movement and how we were able to know about the Trayvon Martin issue, which I think before social media, right. no one would have known something like that ever happened, he would have just been another black kid shot and dead, and we don't know why. Same thing with Sandra Bland, and I mean, we can go down the list of names. Uh, for me, the Black Lives Matters movement reminds me of, you know, it's kind of like our generation, Black Panther Party, uh, where the value of kind of having a level playing field again, I hate to go back to that, but that was kind of their movement, and standing up against police brutality were, the foundations of that party at the time. And, and those are kind of the philosophies and the foundation of that whole Black Lives Movement as well. Okay. So you kind of- I've got, okay, so I gotta bring it. I'm gonna say two things that are completely separate. We can circle back to one or the other. I'll see whatever gets you guys fired up the most. But so there's two things. <laughs> the first thing I'll say is that I have a concern and Amy's gonna point some stuff out in the chat. She says she's not pretty enough to join us, but we'll see if her and I are going to the same place. I have concerns about the accessibility of social media and the fact that it's really easy to seem like you're doing something when you're just really talking a lot. And talking is good, but realistically, if all Martin Luther King had done is give a speech, we wouldn't be where we are today. There had to be the speech and the rally and the walk and the action. Um, right. So I'm a little, I get a little worried when I see things like Black Lives Matter and people are like, yeah, I'm contributing and all I'm really doing is saying something on Twitter. 
So there's that. And then also the whole, so I was really frustrated. I posted a poem of a little, it's a little adorable black girl who's doing spoken word and she's saying, hey, black child, you can be something awesome. Hey, black child, you can you can excel. Hey, and it's it's not always it's addressed to hey, black child over and over. And I got really frustrated. I'm like, why not all children? Why we got to call out race? Why can't we just say all children? Why are we why are we drawing attention to our differences versus just embracing everybody? And I had a really awesome conversation with a friend of mine, a Jamaican woman. She was like, Well, you come to London. I want to talk to you about this, and I don't want to do it on social media, so I won't call her out. But um, she was like, We need to call out race, and that's why the Black Lives Matter so much is such a great deal because we need to call out race because if we don't it's assumed that we mean white or it's assumed that we mean the majority um so it's important to call out that black lives matter specifically because otherwise they get lost in the mix with that in mind when i hear that perspective i think of black lives matter as being a way of encouraging and focusing on what's happening in a way that makes sure that black people don't get ignored and that there is more of an even playing field when you start to point to the fact that it feels a little bit more like black panther that's actually the, mo the notion that i'm a little worried about because my view of the black panthers from what i've learned from history is that they got very angry and very violent and very like we deserve something so we're going to go and get it and I don't I don't I don't know that I want to see another race war. I don't want to see like people fighting and hurting each other. So anyway, I'll stop talking and let you guys react. I said a lot. And and to your fact, I mean they had a they had oh, a special sorry. on PBS about this uh, in action in the Black Panther Party, there's been a, a really big misconception about what they were all about. I think the media kind of spun the whole fist raise in the air movement. It, 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 they were giving the inner city folks food uh they were you know making sure women uh, they did a lot them. of good stuff too i yeah absolutely sure. Sure. and sure. they they sure. right so is that what you mean when you say black panther is that is the, the positive side well no it's it it's yeah. all of it you see what gets see and this is perfect that you bring that up and i'm so glad you brought up the black panther party because what people tend to focus on when it comes to people of color is violence what gets missed is all of the other things that happened before the violence came see and i know you said you didn't want to go too That's far back but i have to bring it back a bit okay there was no, there's no really big focus on lynching, right? Now, people talk about it, but there's not this, oh my gosh, you know, there's not this pearl clutching moment when you think about how many families lost fathers because somebody thought that this man just happened to look at my wife, daughter, sister, mother, in a particular way that I didn't like. So I'm gonna go out, get my friends and hang him up. But there's a pearl clutching moment when you mention Black Panthers because somebody made the wrong turn in the California State Assembly and walked into the wrong room with a gun. That's what gets brought up. People remember the small things, but they don't remember the larger context in the conversation. And what winds up happening is that what gets lost is the meaning behind the party. What the party was saying is that you say you have the right to the second amendment and the second amendment is for all people. And I'm gonna show this community that they too have the right to that same second amendment. And really, you have the right, not just to the Second Amendment, but, but the first through the 26th, right? You have the right to all of that. But they get, but we get caught up on one focus, one aspect of it. And that's where media plays a big role in how we see history. Because when you look back for footage, the footage that you'll find, you won't find a lot of footage on the meals that they served, the daycare centers that they started, the um, GED programs that they started. You won't find programs on, you know, the um, them talking to people about 
creating their own businesses, transportation. You won't find that information readily. You'll find it, but it'll take you time. What you will find information on is, oh, they started a riot here. There was violence here. And that's, I think that's right there when you talk about leveling the playing field. And, and that's I feel a like part that's the, the media in general, though. The media always sensationalizes and focuses on the violence and the negativity. So this is where I wanted to jump in with a comment about social media. Hi, Amy. Hi. Um, and the two <laughs> points that I want to make why uh, that concern me about social media when we're talking about um, not just race, but greater social issues. It's playing out right now with Trump also, right? And here are the two, the two concerns that I have. One is the phenomenon of if I read it on the internet, it must be true, right? So some <laughs> jackwad can create a website that says, you know, uh, Martin Luther King Jr. is the Antichrist. <laughs> and it's true because you read it. So that is a concern that I have that um, we're, we're in a culture, we're inside a cultural phenomenon right now where my opinion can occur as fact for another person, right? My lies can mm -hmm. also occur as fact for another person. The second thing that concerns me right now, and you see it on Facebook, right? Like Nat Natasha, your version of Facebook is radically different than my version of Facebook based upon your behavior. Right. So by me yes. liking and not liking, viewing and not viewing different content, I see a very particular sliver of the Facebook universe. And it comes to like, I don't see a lot of Trump lovers on my Facebook feed. Most of the content I see about Trump is he's a fucking lunatic. <laughs> and why is that? Because the people that I engage with, the companies that I engage with, the content I engage with, all agree and are in alignment with this slice of the internet that says Trump is another. Right? I don't see the stuff that says, oh, Trump is the best thing to happen to the universe, because I'm not aligned with that. So when we're talking about something like race and the whole Black Lives Matter thing, it's very easy to see a very small segment of all of the information and the opinion that are out there so that your opinion just gets reaffirmed time and time and time and time again. So those are the two things that really concern me about um, how we experience social media. I think in today's age, you have to be an elite consumer of information to absorb everything that's out there. And honestly, we are doing an awful fucking job of teaching our children how to consume media. <laughs> an awful job. I, I think mic drop moment with my little pink chat <laughs> to make myself presentable for that. Because my hair was out all over here. I was running around like crazy doing social media stuff today. So. Whatever. I'm glad you threw in pigtails and joined us. And that's, that is, yes, yes. What do you got, Kevin? No, I, I can see you sitting all around up. Where I stumble across a lot on social media is this whole idea of being pro-black is being anti-white. And, and that's so far from the truth because I, I'll so, be the first to tell you, I have some, I have some of my greatest friends are, are white. I think if you look back in the history books, people that walked with Dr. King and, and those folks, he walked right hand in hand with, with white men. So, what it is is similar to us having the NAACP or have the whole Black Lives Movement is a way for us. It's a soapbox for us to to say we matter, we count. Here's our voice. Um, again, yes, social media has gotten carried away with the hashtag and, and everyone's trying to put. I mean, there's a, a beautiful website. I, I don't have it open right now, but I'm sure if you just Google Black Matters, there's a entire website that shows you how you can get involved. Uh, they, they notify you when there are going to be rallies and, 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 and things of that nature so people can get involved that are interested in, in the movement. So, again, Black Lives Matter, it, it's like Amy said, it's, it's what's out there on the social media, what they're giving you. But behind the scenes, it, it's a really great movement. For young people to, to so let me let me give you the the um, opinion of the well-meaning I so white I glow in the dark um, class of people and it's kind of in alignment with what um, what Sunny said I grew up in a neighborhood that's a hundred percent white and went to a school that was forty percent white 
right? All of my friends growing up since I was at the time I was a little girl were, um, were a mix of color and race, right? Um, so I had a, a little bit of a different experience growing up in the suburbs in that I went to such a, a, a ethnically and culturally mixed uh, school system. Um, and when the whole Black Lives Matter thing started up and people started back with the All Lives Matter, I was like, I, I agreed with Sunny. I'm like, why do we have to call out race? Calling out race again and again and again just cements inside our language because our words become our world, right? And context is decisive. So when we continue to talk about race and segregate it in our own mind, doesn't that just reinforce it all? So that's kind of where where like some of us as white liberal chicks are coming from, right? And so I, I was kind of with Sonny's opinion with um, this whole Black Lives Matter versus All Lives Matter thing until I read this stupid little post on Facebook, right? It said, picture this. So, uh, so for all you white folk out there, picture this, you're out at dinner. There's four people at the table. Everybody orders. One dude's meal doesn't come, right? So he's like, hey, what about me? My dinner matters. Everybody else at this table says, why, yes, all dinners matter and continue to eat their meal. It's true that all dinners matter, but it doesn't lessen the fact that this one dude doesn't have his dinner, right? So once I, I saw read another, that, there was what? another great analogy on uh, nine one one. You call nine one one and say my house is on fire, and then nine one one operator says, you know, the guy says we're on our way or whatever. And the, the, the guy's like, well, you don't you need my address. He's like, no, I don't need your address. All houses matter. That's another excellent oh. analogy. So yeah, it's it's <laughs> yes. So I yes. think we're in this really interesting place right now of, um, and in so many different areas, right? Um, look at the political scene and how our political system is going, how our work culture is going. I think we're on this precipice, this knife's edge, right? Where massive change is about to be brought forth. And we as a collective get to choose, is that evolution or revolution? So think about that for a second. <laughs> well, so that's actually yes. Let's 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 segue that into Sarah's question around where are kids today hearing the message that they can't be successful in higher education places, and let's actually morph that a little bit into where are kids, specifically kids in minority families, hearing that they can't be successful. And I think that there's there's got to be some of that in the education system. There's got to be some of that coming from families and from parents who've been beaten down and have kind of like accepted their fate. And I, to, to Amy's point, we get to choose as a society. And this gets into the conversation I have every taboo talk, it seems like, where I don't have kids, but I'm still responsible for modeling for the next generation what's OK. Just because I haven't created any other little humans doesn't mean that what they create as the future isn't going to impact me, right? So what do we collectively as a society, like what can we do about it? Where are kids hearing this message that they can? And are we going to let it just evolve and let whatever's on the internet be fact and let them just learn happenstancely? Or is there going to be a revolution? And if who's if so, who's going to lead it? And I could talk for a long time about that alone. So I'll stop talking and let you guys react. So the question is, what is our individual responsibilities as um, as uh, like stakeholders in our society for how children are raised around the topic of race? The question is probably two or threefold. So one, where are kids getting the message that race is an issue? Because they're not born thinking that. So where do kids? Where are kids getting imprinted with? The fact that I'm black or any minority means that I'm not going to be able to succeed. And then two, how can we collectively as a society impact whether or not it's just like this natural evolution from the internet or whether or not we choose a revolution? So, so I mean, today, I'm sorry to jump in, but if you look at it today, in, like um, I'll point out inner city sh Chicago, uh, for example, uh, we say that we have a level teaching field for kids. Uh, they've given us standardized tests uh, that all kids must take to kind of get into higher education. But if you look at inner city Chicago, those kids uh, who are mostly minority and poor are asked to do the same thing other kids are doing in schools where there's no air condition or there's no heat uh, and it's freezing outside. Uh, there's mold in the walls. There's asbestos in the air. I mean, all these conditions that don't make what they're trying to do even and they're they're not having an opportunity to succeed because the atmosphere that they're trying to learn in isn't the same as someone in a better neighborhood. Um, and, and if I'm coming from that, I'm gonna say, 
I'm not going to have the same chance because I'm seeing everyone else succeed and I'm not because of my conditions. You know? So is that an, uh, more of a, an economic condition or is that solely defined by race? I, That's a question, I to, right? I, I tend to see I tend to see the well, school systems in lower income neighborhoods to be inadequate versus schools in better income homes or, or neighborhoods. Well, but that that's directly correlated to how our government runs and where the tax dollars go. That's that and that's an economic thing. That's not necessarily which, which then again makes me feel like well, if I'm black, I don't stand no, a chance because I'm in an economic I'm, neighborhood that doesn't have a chance to succeed. Agree. <laughs> but look at New York, but look at New York City, right? New York City is in terms of if we're looking at economics definitely has way more okay. money than the rest of New per York square State. footage yeah right that's just yeah. how money is per square footage right but if you look at just in Manhattan right I live in Harlem schools in my district do not get the same in terms of computers books um, whatever type of resources as school, and I'm in District 5, as schools in District 1 or 2, which are lower Manhattan, you know, closer to the financial district. So it's not, it doesn't, it's not just about the finances of it. It's also about if you look at your census map, where are people located geographically on your, just from the census alone. That's how they also break up money. Um, it's, there's so many things that come into play around how a child gets educated. That, yeah, that's, we're doing whole, that talk. that's a whole nother taboo <laughs> talk. But if we're looking But that's a whole nother taboo so, talk. Like, but if if I could redirect at, this. Go ahead. No, no, yeah. no, no. Hold on. I want to point back. You said Manhattan is not all of New York City. Oh, no but doubt. I will tell you this: in all five boroughs, no it happens. Doubt. It happens in the Bronx. It happens in Brooklyn. It happens in Queens. It happens in in Staten Island. I just use Manhattan as one, you know, one one sample of sure. the other five the other five boroughs. But it happens in all of them. But a kid who a kid who is living in I would say who, whose family is making less than median income, right? If they're, if the basics for them are not covered, that is shelter, food, and clothing. When they walk into the school building in the okay, morning, but that, they're okay, already so how is at that a disadvantage. That's not an economic conversation though, because then because we get what into, like, how do we, how do I fix that? How do we as society suddenly fix that? So like, I, Yes, they live in a low-income area, therefore they don't have the same supplies going in. But is that really a race conversation? I'm very aware that this could be my white privilege talking. Well, I'm asking legitimate questions. No, 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 and then it's fine. It's totally fine. But here's here's one way you could fix that. Okay, when someone shows up for an interview, for a job interview. Where, they're, where according to their resume, if you didn't see their name, according to their resume, they're qualified, call them back for it. But I know from example, the reason why my name is Natasha and not my first name is because yeah, I was no, not I, getting I, called I back for interviews with my first name. Nobody calls me back because I, but I got called. have to use my, my legitimate first name of Sarah. So I get that. But that like, how do, okay, let's go back to school, though. So when a kid walks into the classroom and they don't have their basic needs met, how is that a race conversation, not an economic conversation? Because yeah. you could say the same thing about kids that grow up homeless. Well, here's the, here's the thing. It can be economic, right? But as, um, sorry, Amy, I lost your name for a second. But as Amy mentioned, context is, dis is decisive. So in my context, as a person of African descent, working in that environment, it's gonna show up to me like this happens to black people all the time. And as that kid who's walking in the classroom, who is Latino, who is, 
black, who is Chinese, who is whatever. If this is happening to them, this so you're saying, happens when it happens to us. When all you're the saying time. when you're inside that, there is no separation between economics and race. So okay, if we suddenly gave kids everything they there need is none. in the classroom, because would that you're solve in it? it? Like, it's like saying your is not important. If, if, so if, if I were to go to a school it, in a say that again, sorry. area, sorry. I'm a millionaire, and I go to a school in a lower-income area, and I suddenly give kids all of the clothes they need, all the books they need, everything they need to start off the school year with success, does that then level the playing field? No, because they're not going to have that by the end of the year. Because, you see, you can give... You can give someone something. It doesn't give them the sense that they've like that it's theirs. It becomes more of a charity. I'd rather earn it and know that it's mine versus you giving me something. I don't want and I think that's a big missing in the race conversation. People I don't, don't want to be given something. Like that's what I was saying at the beginning. Like I don't want to judge just them a woman. I want know to that they, so right. it's like that it gets tricky. You want to earn it. That's the whole thing. You just want to earn what you know you've earned. A bachelor's degree is a bachelor's degree. I really don't care where you get it from. And I know people will say, oh, one is from Harvard is different than this. No, it's a bachelor's degree. Okay. You may have learned something a little more here and a little less there, or it, it's still a bachelor's degree. It says that I have met a but then particular second, standard. Now, okay, but you want to earn it, but then where do you go? It's like this is then, and I again, I keep saying it. I know this is white privilege talking, and I want to have the conversation because I don't want to like you know what I mean. Like educate me. I don't. I just want to make sure everybody knows where I'm coming from. It that, that gets really tricky for me because you're saying don't give it to me. I'm mad that yeah. I don't have it. I want to earn it, but don't make it to where I get to earn it because of who I like. I don't see access to any action or a revolution there. Pick me. <laughs> so, like, I think the original part of the question, and if we could get to the heart of it, I think that gives us all access to looking beyond what is currently here to the next thing, which is where is the idea instilled that whatever color you are, let's say, okay, so for black kids, right? Where does that idea come from that as a black kid, I can go this far, but not any further? Right? Yeah, that's what we started with, yeah. Yeah, where so I, I think idea? that, and we're, we're, we're dissecting a part of it, right? Which is the economics of it, right? The, particularly the economics of our school system. That is certainly a part of it, but like on an ontological level, right? When we're talking about being, um, where is it that um, black kids today have that idea instilled that I can go this far but no farther? And I think, yeah. So, so Kevin, I want to hear from you. You get very. I feel like I have to look after you because you get very quiet. I know you have I, valuable things. I love. I love. I, was, I love taking it all in. I, I honestly, this this situation. I mean, it's it's bigger than finance. It's it's economics. It's all of these things incorporated. I mean, I, I'm fortunate enough that I get to mentor some some kids uh, in a in a high school that's in a lower income neighborhood. And you know what? They totally they tore down the high school and built up a brand new high school, brand new everything, brand new books. But that mentality is still there because when they come out of that school and they have to walk home and they have to go to the store or the corner store, they're still walking through the same projects where usually the people surrounding them haven't had anything higher than a high school education. And so when you're surrounded by that, that's what your mentality becomes. Um, I think how we fix that is we, we, we get out there and we show them that there is something better than that. But again, that's a bigger, that's a, another bigger story is we don't have enough manpower or enough people of color in positions that can say, we need to generate dollars to put back into programs that are going to help the inner city school kids see that there is no ceiling for them. Because right now that's all they see when they come out of the, the brand new school that they just built, brand new books and brand new computers. And and the thought that they've leveled the playing field by making a brand new school, so. How, I'm still left like, how can I impact that? 
Because hmm. I can't model that. I can't model. I mean, I mentor kids as well. And I've got a few kids I mentor that are minority races. I can't model for them what it's like to be a strong black woman. I can't. I can model what it's like to be a taller and loving white woman. You could, but it would be weird. It would be really weird. <laughs> I will be by what we by what we depict on television, I mean, Sorry. take a look at, and I hate to point out any particular show, but I've never seen it, but I know the mo the show, The Empire, is really big. I mean, the main characters, um, look at their characters. I mean, one's drug dealer and the drug dealers. I mean, if that's what we're painting the picture for young kids to emulate, like we need, and I hate to go back to this, but the Cosby Show, for example, because I love the Cosby Show despite the drama around that, but we need more shows like that showing young kids in inner cities that there is a level of success outside of your neighborhood that you can obtain and totally agree because that goes back to like the reinforcing of you know your words become your world and reinforcing um like what's what has been so right it's just like the use of the 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 n-word i can't even bring myself to say the word and it horrifies me when i see it on like twitter or something like that or i hear it in a lyric um I, like that word is just it's like the c word is just abhorrent to me and i can't understand why people use it right so what can, so i think that's where the the conversation gets really interesting so how can we as a collective start breaking apart that system that gets entrenched and keeps people saying just this far but no further so like what what do you two see as some um ways that we can go past that you know like i see what's there for me um in my white privileged world right um but like you're on the streets in harlem natasha like what's there that you can see that we can start changing from a structural standpoint inside our culture that can maybe help us move beyond that Taking, taking like the entertainment question, right? Like there are, there's no Cosby well, show today that showed like a, a morally, a, at the time, morally upstanding um, family of color who were super successful doctors, right? right. Um, so what ca we can't control what goes on television, right? We can't control or what we demand for and what we encourage, yeah. Right, so like, no, you, like what can we start doing? Yeah, well, I'll answer your question oh, by, bring it on. <laughs> and I know you might not like this, by asking you this, <laughs> what is it that you see that What is it that I see that do? I can do? Yeah, from where, from where you sit, what is it that you see? That's a that really make fucking a excellent question. In your community. Like it really is. That's, so that's <laughs> because here's the thing. I could tell you what would make a difference. No, because really I could tell you what would make a difference for me here right. in Harlem, but that's not gonna do anything for you. Right? It may do something for you if you come to Harlem, right? Um, you come hang out at my house, it may do something for you but it won't really change the conversation where you are because it's what you see that you can do inside of your community that would shift the conversation. When you hear someone saying, saying the N word, just like when I hear someone saying the C word, you know, it's, I'm I gonna speak to that because that's I what I can do in my community. When I hear kids- Russia, And I think word. that- Yeah. I think that's a brilliant question. And I think that we need to move there's, I think that, how do I say this? I think there's a lot of people that could that could stand a benefit from taking a moment to answer that question for themselves. And for those of us that have been looking at that for a while, what I'm looking for is how do I get beyond that? Like, I wanna see community start connecting to make a difference on a broader scale. Mm -hmm. um, and, and to be honest, like where I've been lately is that I can't do anything because I'm white. I can't model it, I can't fix it, I can't give it to you. I like, I mean, I, I, I don't see access to anything that I can do. And I don't like that. Like, I don't do well with that. I don't like no action. I don't like to talk about something I can't do something about. So then I get really frustrated. I got a, so I got a, I was driving from a mall in Orlando to my boyfriend's house, which is on the other side of the, the not white safe neighborhood, which I now call the roll your windows up neighborhood. And here's why because I was driving, bebopping along to my music, not paying attention. I stopped at a stop sign 
and two black teenagers came up to my car. One of them leaned in the window, one of them stood in front of my car, and they asked me if I was lost. I said, no. He said, baby, I think you're lost. Now, in the 30 seconds between me figuring out what I was gonna do and actually having to take action, a truck, a huge truck pulled up behind me and honked, and the boys left. So I didn't have to do anything. But they were totally, I mean, in my perception is that they were trying to carjack me. And my normal reaction would have been to take off. And I don't care if there's a kid in front of my car, I'm gonna drive away and take care of myself. But immediately I'm in the, in the conversation of this taboo talk coming up and I'm thinking, I'm a white lady. These are two black boys. I don't wanna be a part of that conversation. Not to mention the fact they're boys. I don't know their story. I don't know their background. I don't know why they're doing this and what led them to this particular moment. I don't. I don't know if they have a gun. For all I know, they're just being stupid. I don't want to hurt. You know. I'm. And of course, my boyfriend's like, no. You roll your windows up from now on, and you hit somebody if you have to. I don't care what color their skin is. You're being reverse rate. But then, I just. I feel like no matter what I did in that situation, I was going to be in trouble. And I, that kind of, to me right now, describes how I feel about race as a conversation overall. Yeah, it, it's being concerned sometimes about the consequence versus just taking the action that you need to you need to take. Greg, I agree with your boyfriend, right? Roll the windows up and hit them and keep moving. Deal with that race conversation if it comes up. Safety first. Look, I live in Harlem. Safety first is always my concern. You know, and it's it's have me it's having that as a yes. consideration yes that is the larger topic right like i have to also have those kinds of conversations with my nephews watch how you wear your pants in the street because hey you may get hit and run over by someone who thinks you're trying to rob them just he may have been the one who came up to you and was like you know i just want to give you directions but because you have this you right. have that's, this concern. That's, like, that's where my head he went might have first. Gotten hit. The first thought I had is they're just boys. Right. It's then I was like, white, they're black. What do I do? Right. But then and then afterwards, I was really right. mad. Like my boyfriend's like, are you OK? What happened? I was like, I'm really mad because I feel like I just was racist. And he was like, what just happened? I told him the whole situation. He's like, you're mad about the race conversation. You could have just been killed. But I was mad that that. And now he's like drawing me a map of the city and telling me where to roll yes. my windows because he's worried that I don't pay attention to these things. I'm like, there's children playing. Why am I rolling my windows? He's like, because they're all black. Look at their houses. Like you're a white girl in their neighborhood. You need to roll up your windows. You don't know what's going to happen. I'm like, I don't want to. I don't want to think this way. I don't want to think this way. And you shouldn't have to, but I mean. Mm -hmm. Just like I don't want either of you to have to think that way when you're in a rich white neighborhood, right? Conversely, it's true too, right? But. And to the flip side of what Oh no, when I'm in a rich white neighborhood, I grab I clutch my purse. A white man walks near me, I'm clutching it tight. Oh, I'm like, he might your, rob me. Your <laughs> statement, Sonny, was a question that Sarah asked over there that I really love. Like, how will I instill the hope of a vibrant future into your kiddos to help break the cycle? Yes. And I'm listening, I'm listening to your story and I'm thinking, you know, what if it was my son out there and he's just got one of those friends that are like, hey, you yes. want to do something crazy? Yes. But yes. Let's go scare her in the car. And you know, I, that absolutely scares me because that could have been my son. But me personally, what I try to do is my kids are being raised colorblind. And I think all children in America should be raised that way. Okay, but isn't that, doesn't that just conflict with Black Lives Matter? Well, there. in all honesty, at that age, they need to understand because that's where it starts. When they're that age, they're still so delicate and fragile that you can mold them. And the way that I want to mold them is that we're colorblind. There's some of us that are so stuck in our ways and so nothing's going to change that we need Black Lives Matter. Like that's not going to change. But when they're at that age of preteen or you know four, five, six, uh, you know my my son's best his best friend and girlfriend he would tell you are like latino and white and i love that i think that's amazing your son's five right that, uh, he's five yeah <laughs> <laughs> and i hope that never changed for him i hope that never changed for him mentally <laughs> but what i do is i still want him to have an understanding of the culture uh what it is to be black in america and what it, it means and some of the the hurdles that both of them will have to endure as they get older and i do that with the music and and what they see on television and, and what they're looking at on their iPad. I try to, try to monitor that so that 
when they do get to an age where maybe they they face a little discrimination, I can say, you remember when, or you remember a time when you were little and this happened, this is how we're gonna address it now instead of being angry and, and we're gonna rob someone and we're gonna you know, blame society. Like, those are the things that I think, and so your story, when you were telling me, I was like, oh God, please don't let that be my son when he gets older. Well, and that's, I mean, like, I did stupid things when I was a kid, and I mentor kids. I know how they think, and, like, that was that was my first thought, was, I don't know if he's even, I don't know if he's just being stupid. I don't know if this kid who's in front of my car is there for a reason, or if he just stopped there because his friend's being dumb. Like, I don't know if this is intentional and by design, or if they're just not thinking things through. But then, you know, I also- Or they could just to- be being jerky kids. Yeah. Like, totally. in the neighborhood, like, I remember totally. growing up, okay, like, we were not, <laughs> let's just say we got up to some nefarious deeds as children, right? And, um, you know, we lived in this little, not, it wasn't a gated community, it was totally open, no gates, except we're on a peninsula, right? So, once you passed the main road, um, like, it was a freaking free-for-all for us kids. Right. And there was a huge band of us. We would like take over neighborhoods with our bicycles and like hop I'm over backyards. Like, little rascal style. Yeah, we were not good kids. We <laughs> would play like I'm dating yes. myself now, right? <laughs> like we would play laser tag back when in you know the eighties when laser tag was a thing throughout the entire neighborhood. Right. Nice. And so you would see these kids, you would look out your back door, right? And there'd be a mob of twenty kids running through your backyard. Right. And um, so we were just up to nonsense antics when we were kids. And just this Halloween, um, I live in a town that has a very famous haunted house. Right. I live in Amityville. There's a famous house here. So we get a lot of interesting um, people roaming about. And you could see people standing on their porches on Halloween, take, uh, like double taking at the, the kids who are not white. You know, we had Latino kids and black kids and Asian kids in the neighborhood because you knew they weren't from here because everybody here is white. Right. Mm -hmm. So to get to your point about raising kids that are colorblind and that hope aspect, I think it's totally possible to raise kids who see the human being first and color second. And I think that um, we have to start. like telling people is possible. Like I didn't have an understanding of what race actually was like in my, for myself as a person until I lived overseas where I was the only white person. Right. Then I, then I got like, just based on the color of my skin, I am different and unique for people and they've never encountered that before. So it wasn't until I was 16 where I really got like, you know, my, my friend Tasha, who is not the same skin color as I like, like I didn't get until I left the country that that was a thing. And then I went to college and like really started interacting with, with people who oriented themselves that uh, al- aligned with this is w- how people of certain skin color behave right like it wasn't until i was in college that that really became a reality for me i think it's i think what you're pointing to though there's a couple of things there so the first thing i'll say is i w- i would prefer for our race to just be human personally um i think what sarah said in the chat is really beautiful i want to read it so people hear it instead of not seeing color we need to learn to see and then appreciate and embrace every color We'd all want to be known and not unseen. Um, so I think she's a point there of like colorblind can, and, and I know what you mean, Kevin, and I think it's beautiful, but I think that that if we're not careful, colorblind could lead to another extreme opposite, right? And an issue in and of itself. So I want to make sure we appreciate and suffer and, and, and honor our diversity. Um, but what you were speaking to as far as um, surrounding yourself with people, like if we seek out people who think the way that we think and make sure that we surround ourselves with that and curate our social media feed and all that fun stuff to make sure that we're all congregating and coming together. And then we actually talk about it. Right. Cause a lot of times I don't, I mean, Tasha, you're different. Cause you and I are, we're, we're girls, but like a lot of times I can't talk about this freely. Like I mean, if I'm on a table with a diverse group of people, if I don't personally know the people who could be offended by the conversation and you don't personally know me and know that I have a big heart, like a lot of what I've been saying to you guys could be really offensive if taken out of context. So I think getting people together who want to forward the conversation and actually having the conversation, um, I don't, I, I would love to see more of that happen. I think maybe that's something that we can all do in our own neighborhoods that you to your point earlier, Natasha. And, you know, I like, Amy, what you brought up about 
once you left the environment that you knew and went to another environment, it opened your eyes. And I think that's something that doesn't always happen sure, for everyone. That opportunity. You know, it's and when I, yeah, you know, why race can continue to be such a big topic is because a lot of people don't leave the environment that they're in. You know, um, I mentioned earlier that my family is from Trinidad and Tobago. So when growing up, you know, I had, I lived in a black community and yet I was still different because my family is Caribbean. So I had kids tease me and say, you know, my parents came off the banana boat and, you know, they don't, I, um, what, like everybody eats coconuts and, you know, like crazy stuff. But then when I went to live in Trinidad, I was again different because I'm American. I wasn't West Indian enough. Then I came back to the States and it's like, oh, you. so, you know, my view about race is that you're always going to be different. It really doesn't matter what you look like. You're really always going to be different depending on what environment you fall in and it's how you deal with the conversation. Because I can be angry all the time. That really is not going to shift anything for me. It's just going to give me high blood pressure, probably give me a heart attack and probably die from an angina somewhere. But if I get that I am different and I take that with a grain of salt and someone says, yeah, you know, your parents came on a banana boat. And I'm like, no, actually they flew. But we'll think about the boat the next time. Yeah, you know, um, and I make a joke about it. It it tends to break up something, you know, it it doesn't give it any power over me and I can now have another conversation with, with someone that they'll really start to be interested in who I am, what I do, what I'm about. And then I get interested in them. And this barrier that could have been created is no longer awesome. there. Yeah. Kevin. Now crickets. That was a nice mic drop. <laughs> <laughs> Is that me? Are you guys, you guys want to hear from me? Is that what it is? I just want to make sure we're giving you a chance to jump in. Of course. Yeah, okay. no. Um, I mean, if I could, I, I bought this book with me. Um, it's a really good book, Miseducation of the Negro by Carter G. Woodson. And when I was Hold doing my- Hold on, I can't see. Hold this yeah. step. Sorry. I was doing my, I was doing my- Miseducation. American Studies. We had to read this as one of the books. And what's funny about this book is I read it, I had to have been 19 or 20 when I first read it. And then I read it again when I was 24. And then I read it again when I was 34. And I think the more I read it, um, I actually pulled out an excerpt from it that it's going to really strike home. And I don't know if we can kind of tie it up because I do want to see the, I want to hear what Trump's going to say. That guy, he amazes me every night. But um, <laughs> it says here, what Carter G. Woodson says, history shows us that it doesn't matter who's in power or what revolution forces take our government. Those who have not learned to do for themselves and, and have the dependency solely on others never obtain any more rights or privileges. And I pulled that excerpt out because, again, it doesn't matter what race, nationality, background, heritage you come from. Um, it starts with us. It starts with the individual person, the I. And then you turn the I into a we and the we into an us and you, you keep it going from there. And that's how we get a revolution. That's how we get change. Um, there would be a lot of factors that won't help. Uh, like we talked about uh, finances in certain areas and government and so forth. But again, you start with the I, you turn the I into we, the we into us. And I think that's kind of how we start to get some change. Can um, you send me that quote, Kevin? Yeah, I'd love it too. Yeah, I'll put it in the resources page. Um, there was a, a, a Reverend Sandra, I don't remember her last name, but we had, um, my church celebrates Black History Month pretty intensely. And I've always, again, same kind of conversation. Like, why do we have a Black History Month? We don't have Jewish History Month. We don't have White History Month. I get it. We got a lot of white, I mean, I get it. In theory, don't go off on me. And I'm like, you know, and but she had something, she she actually made some really awesome points that kind of tie into the book than the quote that you just read, Kevin, 
that um, when she was a kid, she was in her 60s. So she said when she was a kid, she went to an all black school and she never learned about a lot of history that had to do with, like she didn't learn about slavery. She didn't like it wasn't in the books. There wasn't a lot of black history in the books. And it wasn't until Black History Month got instituted that we actually started paying attention and we started realizing the fact that it wasn't in the books and that we needed to focus on it and we need to make sure we don't forget our history. Um, which was, a re I was really grateful for that perspective because it now has me even more embrace the idea of Black History Month and making sure, and, and really just looking at where are there gaps in what we're taught. I was homeschooled, I'm really lucky. My mom did a really good job of being thorough. It didn't even occur to me until I was in my late 20s that some people just get stuff skipped, you know? Um, so yeah, Sarah, I thought it really, the way she said it really made a difference for me. Um, and she gave some specific examples. I was furiously taking notes and then I didn't save them of, um, specific like people in black history that she didn't learn about until she was much older because it's just not history books. And there are people that I was shocked about because like, I know all about them. Like, how could that not have been, you know? So, um, it's just, it's all, and there's always another perspective. That's why I love having these conversations with you guys, especially when there's places where I don't like my perspective, but I don't know, I don't have anything to replace it with, you know? <laughs> um, so I love what you're saying about start with the I. I still am going to continue to have the conversation about what can I do? Because yeah. I would I will own it. I will start with the I. Tell me what I well, can do to I help think, and I will do it. I think that quote is a really great starting place for what can I do to help? Mm -hmm. Right. I think there are so many places in our lives where we can have that like um, like that Rosa Parks moment on the bus where you're just not going to accept something any longer. Right. Like I've broken up fights just because I refuse to have violence in my in my general neighborhood. Right. I just don't want violence inside my space. Um, so I think that if we all just start with the basic of this is not appropriate and I'm going to call it not being appropriate. I think that might be the, you know, lowest common denominator space that we can stand in. Yeah. I think that I was, again, I, I, part of what I get out of Taboo Talk is doing the research and the conversations that lead up to it for me to be prepared to come here and hang out with you guys. Um, and I was having a conversation with, with a friend uh, a few days ago and I was saying how I get frustrated because I feel like I can't say anything. I had, a, I had a situation hmm. fairly recently where I saw somebody being treated differently because of their color. And I was concerned that if I said something, I was going to be the one that was drawing attention to it. And she was like, well, you're just being a pansy. So I'll give you like, and a I was like, okay, okay, that's fair. I'll give you a perfect situation of like, uh, not knowing really like, like as the white chick, what to do. I, I saw this conversation explode on my Facebook page where, um, uh, so I have a secret passion for um, natural African-American hair, right? I've always wanted an Afro and the little twists and the cornrows. I've just always wanted it. Okay. Yeah. Don't judge. Um, yeah. I have frizzy you white curly hair. Right? And I went to school with all these girls who had this luscious like poofs and twists with the little plastic barrettes on the bottom. Anyway. So they were getting into this conversation about um, natural hair and um, somebody just went off on like racist white girls wanting to touch her hair. And I'm, I, and so I interjected and I'm like, hey, this is coming from a white chick. I don't know what it feels like, right? Does it feel like my hair? Like I've never encountered it before. This is when I was younger, right? So I, be, me being the young stupid kid that I am, I asked my girlfriends, I'm like, can I touch your hair? And we would braid each other's hair, right? But like, I think we get ourselves boxed into this place of where I don't want to be called a racist. Exactly. So I'm not going to insert myself into that um, situation. Like, that's why I love this um, environment because I can say stupid white girl shit, right? And it not be stupid white girl shit. It comes from a place of really like inquiry and like, this is a world I don't know about. And I think that um, we have to, um, I think it's so easy for us, particularly with Trump that's going on right now to default to, oh, you're a racist. Right? Well, Amy, I'm gonna give you a secret. And since this is a secret for you too, you know, black people are racist, right? Oh, I do. Oh, yeah. Oh, I do. Ooh, I said it. I said it. I what? said it. <laughs> yeah. What? Black people well, are racist. Everybody is racist. Yeah. I mean, everybody's got some in them. Everybody's got a little something about something. And I think, um, especially when it comes to hair, 
that it's like, um, as my mother would say, this is more of a West Indian saying than it is a black saying. It's like someone touched your corn. You know, the corn in your toe that if the shoe is too tight, it rubs like, it a little too it. hard. Okay. So you have to. It's, but if you ask, see, I from I come from the opinion of if you ask me, right, and I say no, and you still do it, that's a problem. Right. If you ask me and I say no, and you respect that, that's do different. Do people touch your head, Kevin? It's not a racist thing. I'm sorry, what was that? Do people touch your head? I mean, it's bald, but yeah, they, they, they're they out of interest for why is it bald, yeah, I do. Like, I I and Natasha, I get the whole world of that. I lived in a really rural town in Japan, and I was literally the first white person people had ever saw, seen, right? So I would be on the bus, and I was on the bus one day in my schoolgirl uniform. You know, I'm 16 years old, and I hear the snip, snip, snip behind me. Somebody cut a fucking lock of my hair, right? Because they've wow. never seen, and my hair was like a little, my hair was lighter. It was lighter brown then, and it was kind of like wavy and, and a little white girl Afro-ish, right? So I get that. I get how that's a violation, right? But I also come from the place right. of, like, there's genuine interest and curiosity. And I feel like yeah. you can't express that genuine interest and curiosity about certain things because we're going to get called racist. Yeah, people touch my hair all the time. All the time. People comment on my hair and they touch it without asking. And granted, I have thick, luscious, gorgeous, weird cut hair, but people will walk up and just do this to me without, I mean, it's got nothing to do with the race. It, it's just its just a thing people do. They make it racist because that's a conversation they have going on in the background. Right. It's, it's just easier to say versus, hey, can you not put your hands in my yes. hair? You know, like, just yes. don't touch me like that. I'm not a chia pet. <laughs> I my head like that. It's like the whole pregnant belly. I mean, there's a whole bunch of things people do to violate personal space, which we're, which we're going to do one on platonic touch, guys. Um, I, I think That's that the biggest thing I got this week in doing all of the research for this and out of talking to you guys is, yeah, I need to stop being a pansy. If I see something happening where I don't think it's okay, it's better to have the person being discriminated against be mad at me than to have not spoken up and had the opportunity to impact the situation. Um, so it's okay. If I get called racist, yeah. it's fine. I know I'm not, I mean, I, I'm sure I'm racist in some way, but I'm not intentionally, I'm not doing it on purpose. I'm, I'm mm -hmm. not intervening out of a desire to create a problem. I'm intervening out of a desire to make, make peace and make people be given that level playing field that Kevin likes to talk about. <laughs> we got to speak up. I mean, I think if we speak up, we'll yeah. Be a bit. Speak all up. pansies matter. Thank you, Amy. Oh. <laughs> all pansies matter. Yeah. Um, all right. So yeah, that's from Amy. No, <laughs> we've uh, we've covered a lot of topics. I know that we're gonna do. There's gonna be a lot more taboo talks on race because we could talk a lot about just Black Panthers and the Civil Rights Movement and have we made progress. We could talk about education. We could talk. I think we could sit here and jam for an hour on just talking about different cultural beauty remedies and hair and makeup and clothes and whatnot. I think. I mean, you know, we could go off on a bunch of different tangents. I'm sure. Yeah, Sarah's like, let's talk about hair. Um, I'm sure there will be more Ooh, talks on bias sub. Yeah. Um, so as we wrap up, is there any? I do this every time. Is there any specific thing, soapbox topic that you were really hoping we were going to get to that we haven't touched on yet? Here. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. <laughs> Awesome. Well, thank you guys for your time. Everybody, this has been Taboo Talk. I do this every week, live Thursdays at 8 p.m. Eastern. Um, I send out uh, an email right now that has all of the resources and quotes and things that I found in research and all the books that we referenced and everything. Um, I'm going to shift that to where it's just a blog available on the website. But either way, you want to go to tabutalk.us and check it out and sign up to follow future blabs and all that fun stuff. Next week, we're doing old people specifically like how we deal with old people in society, but I'm just calling it old people. And we're going to see where that takes us. Um, <laughs> oh, I, <you're, laughs> hey, what's old? Oh, Wait, I need I to know. <laughs> threshold for old because my birthday's tomorrow. <laughs> oh, well, so we could. Maybe your birthday's tomorrow. Happy birthday, yeah. Happy birthday, Sarah, yeah. your dad would be Happy welcome birthday. as a guest. <laughs> So I want to talk about how we handle aging people and the fact that all these baby boomers are retiring, but I'm open to talking about how we handle aging, how we respect old people, what defines old and why are we scared of being, I mean, there's a whole, we're just going to let the conversation run. And then again, we'll do more detailed taboo talks later once we figure out what the more uh, niche conversations are that come out of it. 
I, Amy, you're not old because you're not that much older than me, and I don't like the idea of you being old. So I'm going to say that you're going to be young on your birthday tomorrow. Oh, yay. <laughs> yay. Amy, I'll say that you'll be seasoned. But, uh, seasoned. Oh, I like yeah. that. I'm going to be a little spicy. <laughs> I'm going to wrap up the yes. recording here. So go head over to tabutalk.us and um, you'll see all the different taboo talks we're going to do every week, 8 p.m. Eastern. Thank you guys for your time. I'm going to end this recording. See you guys next week. Thanks, Sonny.